maybe share a little bit from my own life experiences on some things. But uh, one thing I've learned, you know, is that commitment is no good without surrender. Surrender always has to precede commitment. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we all, we've all just kind of been through the new year and I know the new year is obviously a time when people are making all these new commitments, these resolves that they're going to do certain things. And, um, and even as Christians, lots of times we just, you know, maybe we're wrestling with things or whatever it is, but you're just saying, you know what, I just, I need to commit myself to, to do this particular thing. I, I really need to resolve to do this thing. And I've realized that, you know, commitment's a good thing, but if it's not first preceded by surrender, we don't really seem to get very far. And I found that, um, and I've been reading this book on, on leadership, but uh, the guy in there, he was talking about, for example, uh, Charles Finney, who was a great revivalist back in the um, 1800s. Uh, and actually, some of his work was done. I believe some of it even came up around Napanee, but he was he was just over the border into New York and stuff too. Um, Billy Graham, as we know, who just passed away, was that a year or so ago? Um, yeah, but anyways, these men. One thing that happened in their lives was that they came to this place where they had some sort of real encounter with God. Uh, Billy Graham, some of you might be familiar, like he used to, he started out ministering alongside of Charles Templeton, who ended up deciding to abandon the faith. And he just had his own reasons why he felt it wasn't, you know, logical to believe the Bible and how can you believe these certain things that are in it. And so, of course, for, for Billy Graham at that time, as a 30-year-old at the time, you know, all this stuff hit him and he was trying to make a decision. And as the story goes, you know, he went out into the the woods, I believe it was, where he used to meet <clears throat> meet with God, and he just got down and and basically the sum of it was he just said, God, I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't have all the answers to these people's questions on these things, but he said, I'm just going to believe you. I am just going to trust you that I'm gonna I'm gonna live for you. I'm gonna walk out my life. I'm gonna believe your word. And wherever you choose to take me, however, the fruit that you choose to bring from it, I just leave that into your hands. And that's the difference between surrender and commitment is you don't always know what the results are going to be. But you just, re- you just surrender to the fact um, that God's going to take care of that. And one difference between commitment and surrender is commitment only involves your will. It only involves your uh, your desire, your commitment to do a certain thing. But surrender is where you're surrendering your will to another's will, which is ultimately to be God's will. And, and then the commitments you make after that will work. And so I just want to start here looking at uh, Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 1. It says there, now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I've provided myself a king among his sons. You know, sometimes there's things that if we're going to move on in life, we, we have to end the mourning sometimes that we're in. And, uh, you know, we all have that tendency to want to go back to the past. We want to change the past. We, we want to correct the past and that sort of thing. And yes, we need to deal with any issues that we have presently from the past, but you can't change the past. We can't change the past. And sometimes we get stuck in this place where we're mourning the things that happened to us, and, and we want to change that. But, you know, the Lord's direction to Samuel here, because he was, he was mourning over King Saul, the first king who was appointed in Israel, and Saul had messed up big time. And it basically, if you go back even the chapter before this, um, it's saying that Saul rejected the word of the Lord. So that's why it's saying here, the Lord is saying, I've rejected him as being king over Israel. It's because he's rejecting the word. He's not, he doesn't want to lead God's people 
by God's word. And so he says, you know, you, you, you've got to go on. You've, just, you've got to leave this Samuel and move on. And uh, <clears throat> as we'll see here, there's a, there's a new thing that God's going to do. And I remember when I uh, first came to the Lord, and I was going to agriculture college, and uh, I came through reading the scripture. There was nobody witnessing to me at that time in my life. I was reading the scripture, and, and just the life of Christ came alive. And I realized, and I was a, I was a church boy. You know, I grew up in the church. Um, but it wasn't until I was 19, and, and at the end of that year, after reading the scripture and just having a real encounter with God, that I realized that, you know, I wasn't a Christian where I was at. You know, I wasn't living the way Christ was calling me to live. And so I came to this place of surrender. And at the time, I'd been dating this girl from high school and uh, would come home on the weekends and share with her. And, and uh, I just came to a point where I decided to break off with her because I, I could see we were on two different paths. And so I did that. And then after about uh, two weeks of hell, I decided <laughs> I wanted to go back and get back together with this girl. I was just saying, you know, God, if you just, if you just, you know, just give me her uh, as a life partner, you know, and, and I'll, I'll serve you all the rest of the days of my life. You ever done that kind of bargaining with God, right? And anyways, so as I say, I, I went back and I tried to get back together with her and it was just a no-go. And which was a turnaround because she was the one that originally... Uh, really wanted to get together with me before I ended up asking her to go out, and we had dated for a year and a half or so. But, you know, God was just saying, he just closed the door on that. And there's times, too, where, you know, we want to go back to Egypt and things. We want to go back to the past. But God is saying, just move on. You know, just move on. And I'm so thankful that that door closed. I'm so thankful that God had his hand on this point my ex-girlfriend to say no because god knows the mess that it would have been because right how can two walk together except they be agreed and that's that's where it was at at the time and i just you know even after that i prayed you know that god would still touch your heart but i knew it was time for me to to just move on in those things and sometimes so often we want to make decisions like one reason I probably wanted to go back and to get together with her was because that was all I saw at the time. It's like, well, who else am I going to go or who else am I going to date type of thing, right? And, and it's like you already have this emotional attachment and everything. And, and so often we make decisions based on that. But, you know, God sees what we don't see. And he say, even says to Samuel, uh, he says, look, I, I want you to fill your horn with oil and go to see Jesse, Jesse the Bethlehemite, because I provided, and the word provided there in the rich, original language actually means seen. I have seen myself, uh, for myself a king among his sons. And God sees what you and I don't see. And that's the whole need that we have to surrender. Like when you just know that you're supposed to go in a certain direction, you don't, you don't see how it's all going to work out. You just have to trust, and, and that kind of trust just takes a surrender to the things of God. And so we go on here in verse 2, and Samuel says to God, after God's given him this direction, he says, how can I go if Saul hears it? He'll kill me. And the Lord says, but take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, we can stop, or I like to stop at these points, and just, you know, put yourself in the story. Put yourself in these shoes. I mean, why, why didn't God, I mean, God, God being God, he could have just taken King Saul and just removed him. He could have killed him himself, right? He could have got him out of the way so that Samuel didn't have to deal with this. Because he knows kings of Saul. Or, sorry, Saul is the king. <laughs> and if he's going to anoint somebody else as king... That's not looking good, right? So that's why he's fearing for his life. And so he's, you know, he's saying, I, I can't do this, God. I mean, my life's going to be in danger if I do this. So the Lord gives him direction how to do it. Instead of God himself just going ahead and just taking Saul out of the picture. 
And so, so many times, we ourselves, we have this way that we think things should unfold uh, to protect us or to keep us or to help us to be able to move ahead in this particular thing. And, you know, I found over the years that God's nature is always predictable, but his activity is not always predictable. God's always loving. He's always kind. He's always good. He's always faithful. He's always there for you. But the way he chooses to walk things out is not always predictable. And I think one reason, I mean, there's probably tons of reasons why we could say why God chose not to take Saul out ahead of time and to make it easy in this particular circumstance for Samuel to do what he's asking him to do is, for one, Israel still needed some leadership. And secondly, God knew that he was going to use Saul to develop the next king, which, as we know, became King David, right? And so there's times where God is doing in your life and my life the, the circumstance, and God just doesn't push everything out of your way for you because he's using that to develop you. He's using that in the whole circumstance, not only you, but even the people around you in your life to help you to come into, help you to step into what he has for you. And so God just doesn't always clear things out like we think he would. You know, and I think of Moses too, like when they came out of Egypt And uh, it says at one point that they were attacked by the Amalekites. And it's interesting, the attack happens after they were complaining, you know, there was was no water there. And so they cried out to Moses and they're complaining, like, why would you bring us up out of Egypt? Why did you do all this? We're thirsting in the wilderness. Uh, Like, have you ever done this? You know, God's brought you to a certain point. It's like, okay, how am I going to get on from this point? to where you're still calling me, like, why don't we just go back to where we were? It was so easy back there. We had food on the table. Uh, We had water that we could draw all the time. And, you know, we have all these things. And so, anyways, the Israelites are complaining. And then in the next few verses, you see this, this group called the Amalekites come in and attack them. And that that, that becomes obvious to us that there's an open door there. The Amalekites opened a door, um, or sorry, the Israelites opened a door that allowed the attack of the the, uh, Amalekites against them. And it's so true in our lives that when we open ourselves up in certain ways, then attacks can come in our life. But you know what? God's not done when that happens. I make mistakes. I don't know about you, but I make lots of mistakes. And But I'm, I'm so thankful to God that even in that time, like when we call out to him, that he comes. You know, he comes. And it's interesting. Anyways, just to finish that story with that attack of the Amalekites, um, Moses, he goes up onto a mountaintop, and he's holding up this rod, which, which obviously is representing that authority in Christ. Um, and so as long as he's holding that up, and Joshua, he goes out leading the army against the Amalekites, as long as he's holding it up, they're winning the battle. But when his arms and his hands get heavy, he can't hold it up, then the Amalekites start winning. And this is going on back and forth. And it's just like, and now we can sit here today and read that story. And he's like, yeah, really? Like, like why just because he drops his arm, why does the other, and the other team start winning? And there's all kinds of types and shadows in there that we won't go into. But the one thing I'll draw on, and that is in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul exhorts Timothy there and and the people that Timothy's ministering. He says, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. And, you know, we got to keep our hands up. That's just part of the picture that I want to draw out here. We We just have to keep coming back, surrendering to God, and just committing ourselves to him, and just believing that what he's doing in your life, in that situation that you're facing, it's always for good. It's always developing you for something more than what you've been. You know, his mark, his, his stamp, his seal is on your life. And he's developing you through that to bring you on. Amen. 
In Deuteronomy 25, or 17 to 19, we see um, just a little bit more detail about what went on here when the Amalekites attacked. And it said, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming up out of Egypt. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear, when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. You know, sometimes the attacks come when we're getting weary. Sometimes, you know, we're straggling behind where God wants us to be. And sometimes you're the one that gets attacked. Well, I just want you to know that God cares about you. And God gave Moses and Joshua, he gave them a plan of protection for them. And even beyond that, uh, he talked about how he was going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation and that they were to ultimately end up destroying and defeating Amalek because of what they did here. Because God was not pleased that the enemy was coming here and attacking their rear ranks and that he was getting those that were weary and tired. And I'm just so thankful, amen, that God, when we're struggling, when we're wrestling with things, that God is there and that he cares for us and that he has a plan uh, to strengthen us and deliver us and to bring other people that will help us to stand. Amen. Amen. And then verse, uh, going on to verse 6 and 7 here in 1 Samuel 16. And maybe just to fill in. As you know, so Samuel ends up going to see uh, Jesse the Bethlehemite, and he has his sons come. And, of course, he's going to anoint one of his sons as king. He doesn't know which one. And so he comes in verse 6, in verse six, it says, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, when we go over a chapter uh, into 1728, we get, for example, just a quick glimpse of Eliab. And it says when, when, when David, later on, he comes down to the camp of the Philistines and he's inquiring about, you know, this Goliath that's standing up and reviling the army of Israel. And Eliab gets upset with him. And uh, in verse uh, 17 and verse 28... It says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, speaking to David here, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And so we see Eliab here. His heart was full of anger. And on top of that, he's despising his father's business. Um... You know, he, he just saw his dad's business as just being, you know, those few sheep. And so God is, again, God, God sees the heart when we only look at the outward appearance. And so Samuel, after he learns this principle, the Lord is saying, you know, don't look at man's outward appearance, but seek to know the heart of a person, you know, that you're going to be putting into this place of kingship, into a place of leadership. And so it's interesting, after he hears this, Jesse having seven of his sons, they come and they pass before him. And Samuel keeps saying, no, it's not this one. No, it's not this one. No, it's not this one. No, it's not that one. You know, after a while, have you ever had that? God said something to you, and after a while you think, did I hear this right? (laughs) <laughs> Did I hear this right? Are you sure, God, about this? And so it's not until he gets down and, and the last ones that are actually even all the sons that are there in the room, it's none of them. And if you put yourself in Samuel's shoes, right? And it's like, did I get this right? And then he says, do you have any other sons? Like, what's going on here? And Jesse says, yes, I have one more son. So as you know, 
David comes in and he anoints him. But um, it's so true with us too that, you know, God, when he teaches you something new, when he gives you revelation on something, a particular area maybe that you need to trust him in, he'll always test you in it. And he's always testing you in it, not because he wants you to fall. He's not, it's not like the devil where the devil's trying to get you to fall, but he's always testing us in it so that we can become stronger, so that we can see our own weaknesses and learn to develop in those areas and come into those things in God. And so I was telling you about how, you know, I was dating this girl in high school, and then that ended. And so I went on on my Christian journey, and um, a girl by the name of Sherry comes along, and uh, it, was, it, was for, it was pretty serious, too. But I just, I just didn't have this peace about it. I mean, I was at the point of, I was ready to get engaged. I actually, I actually went. Um, she was from Windsor. I went all the way to Windsor to see her mom because her her dad wasn't in the picture, and uh, to ask for her daughter's hand in marriage. And I'm on my way home, and I just, I just have no peace about it. I'm just thinking, okay, I'm just, I'm just fighting the devil here. It's just all these thoughts of the enemy, and I just couldn't get past it. And so. I, I just I called her up and I said, Sherry, I said, uh, this is what's going on. Um, I don't know why, but I said, maybe we just need to just kind of back off a little bit and, and uh, click. And uh, I called back again. And anyway, so we did talk for a couple more minutes. But anyways, to make a long story short on that end of it, um, it that, that's, that relationship didn't happen. And then after that, Karen came along and it's like, so I'm like, Lord, what about this one? You know, God, what about this one? What, what about this one? And so she goes by, and then Faye comes along, and it's, okay, um, Lord, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? Anyways, and one time with Faye, I was out um, for dinner, and just the day before, the Lord had said to me, you know, I just wasn't having any peace. Actually, I'm going to back up from the dinner time. I was... What happened was I'd met this girl. I was, I had, was doing some maintenance work at this home, and there were three girls that were living, renting this house. And I was living in Belleville at the time. So I went there to do some maintenance work. And uh, so I met this girl, and we kind of went out a few times. And then one time I'm over there fixing, I don't know, it was something, a mirror on her dress or something. So I'm there. The other two girls aren't there. There's nobody in the house. And Faye's sitting on the bed, chatting away to me, and I'm working on this mirror. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, Peter, what are you doing here? And all of a sudden, I realize the situation I'm in. We're in a bedroom. There's nobody else in the house. And so I just said, that's a good question, Lord. (laughs) I didn't say anything to Faye. And so I just finished up quickly what I was doing. And... uh, and then got out of there and, and kind of said to her after that, I said, you know, it would really be good if, you know, there was somebody else there when I come over to fix something. And so, uh, so we did that. And she kind of actually tested me on that <laughs> one time after. But uh, anyways, then it came to a point where I just realized I just wasn't getting a piece on this. And so when I knew that was happening, uh, Faye and I had decided to, to go out for a dinner time. And we went to this restaurant. We're sitting there eating. And I'm working out my courage to say, you know, this is what I'm feeling from the Lord. I think this relationship's over. And the waitress comes and she serves us. And we're chatting with her a little bit and talking back and forth. And she says to us, so are you two married? And uh, I said, we said, no, we're not. And she said, well, you should be. You guys make a good couple. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. <laughs> How am I going to get out of this now? But anyways, you know, I just followed through with it. But anyways, uh, stuff comes along, and it's not always easy to walk out. And we're always making decisions based on the time. So anyways, yeah, Faye goes out of the picture. And, and anyways, I'm not going to name all these girls, but there wasn't a lot. <clears throat> but uh, as some of you know, I was 42 before I got married, before Anita and I got married. And 
all through that time, you know, God is working me, testing me on these things, just getting me to listen to God. And, and you know, one of the things, one of the scripture verses, I think I gave you this to Ryan, Colossians 2.15, or sorry, 3.15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. And that was just something I was holding on to all the time. I had my dad come to me at one point, and this was back when, in the relationship with Sherry, and, and when I let that relationship go, and I was broke down, I was crying on my mom's shoulders. And dad said to me after, he said, you know, he says, I think you really need to reconsider this relationship. And um, I, just, I just said, Dad, I can't. Like, it, I mean, I'd like to, but I said, if, I've, if I haven't heard from God on this, I've never heard from God. Because I know, I know what I heard and I know what I felt in, in my salvation experience. I, I knew what I sensed as I was moving along and things, you know. And it's just like, for me to go back on that would be for me to go back on my salvation, really. And so that's kind of how I said it to my dad. And uh, in the situation with Sherry. And so, I forget where I was going with that one. But anyways, <laughs> but anyways, um, so yeah, with Anita, there came a point where we'd been uh, dating for about a month or so, I guess. And I just felt like I was questioning, God, am I putting her before you? And I was always always been sensitive that way in terms of, you know, wanting God to be first in my life. And I can remember, like, the, I can remember where I was driving, turning off of Walbridge Loyalist Road and just wrestling with that in my heart. And I just said, okay, God, like, if I need to give this relationship up, then I, it's done. It's over. And I just, I really had resolved it in my heart that I was going to tell her that. And so it might have been three, four hours later, I'm kind of wrestling with this. I'm just saying, okay, God, I'm willing to give her up, but I want to make sure. I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing because I don't want to mess around with somebody else's emotions and that sort of thing And if I'm missing it. And so uh, some of you know Neil and Marg that attend here. They're in Florida right now. But uh, they were spiritual parents to me, and so I thought I'm just going to go over there and just share my heart with them and what's going on. And I even called Anita up. And I said, you know, this is what's going on in my heart. And I said, it has nothing to do with you personally, but I'm just, I'm just wrestling with this peace, you know, getting a peace about this. And so I went over there to their place that night and just poured out, shared my heart. And Neil and Mark never said yes or no, I think you should do this. They just sat there and just listened to me. And before I left there that night, I just, I knew that Anita and I were supposed to be together. And I look back on that, you know, that whole wrestle and the whole thing. And, and for me, I really saw it. It was kind of like an Abraham-Isaac experience. And you know, the story where Abraham had to give up his firstborn son. He waited for 20 years for this promise of his own offspring, his own son. He finally gets it. And then God's telling him he wants him to offer him to him on an altar and sacrifice him to the Lord. And, of course, as you know, the story goes... Abraham does that, but ultimately, in the end, he doesn't have to sacrifice all Isaac when he lifts up the knife. <clears throat> um, you know, God says, okay, no. Now I know that you fear me. And I think, did God not already know? Did he not already know Abraham's heart? Yes, he already knew Abraham's heart. But, you know, one of the things I learned out of that is God wants to experience your love and my love. He wants to experience that relationship. And some things you do, some things you just walk out because that is the experience of God receiving from you the reality of what you're saying. And, and then it's easy after that. It, you know, so as I say, like for me, it's like, okay, I knew it was okay for me to have a peace and go, go on in this relationship uh, with Adina and for us to be married. And... One thing that happened to me in that time was I just settled in my heart was that I said, okay, God, if, if I miss it ministry-wise, I said, then just help me to be a faithful husband. Just help me to be a faithful life partner to her. And 
you know, before that, I know that that wouldn't have been my main focus. And I'm not, I'm not diminishing ministry. Uh, you know, we all have a call in our lives to ministry in, in some avenue. But for me, it's just I would have put ministry ahead of her. And it just helped me to begin in my own life to say, you know what, like if I ever reach a point, and even recently I've said this to Anita too, it's just like if, if our relationship is being uh, destroyed or brought down uh, because I'm getting over-involved in ministry, then I just, I just want to step back from it. Like I do not want to put my marriage on the altar of ministry. It's, it's not worth it. And you all know, too, you know, there's, there's lots of examples out there in history of people who went out and they may have been winning the world, but they lost their own family. They lost their own marriages. And ultimately, you know, what really speaks louder? And so that was something. That was one reason God had me go through that experience. I believe that. And I can always look back. And if, if I ever felt these accusations of the enemy come, coming at me and saying, well, you're just putting her first. I could always look back and say, no, that's where this experience happened, and I know it's not. You know, it's so good to have times in your life where you've driven a stake, and you know, you know, that you've met with God on those things. Now, afterwards, sometimes we can have the temptation where God's asking you to give something up, and you go, okay, I know how this works. Yeah, I'll just say I'm going to give it up, and then he's going to give it back to me, and I get what I want. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way either, does it? There's, there's times where there's things you give them up and, and they're gone. You just, you just have to leave them. And that's because God's got something better. God's always got something better. And, you know, that whole time, um, you know, the Lord was doing something in Anita too. And even previous to, to our getting together, um, the Lord brought her through some relationships and she got to a point where she said, I'm not going to pursue a man. And so we had met, actually, before we actually started dating, we had met three years previous to that and saw each other on a couple occasions. And then I was involved in this music group, and, and uh, the guy in this music group was going to the same church that it needed to was at the time. He said, hey, listen, there's this guy I really think, you know, you guys would be good together. You should come out and see him. Come on out to the band and see us and meet this guy. And she said, well, who is it? And so she said, well, it's this guy, Peter, Peter Fox. And she says, no, I've already met him. She says, he's not interested. I've already been there. So, But, you know, she had other experiences in life. She was not going to come and do it. She was not going to pursue me. She was going to wait for a guy to pursue her. And you know what? Honestly, when I go back and I talk to you about some of these other relationships I've been through, and I'm not exalting myself in this situation at all. But in a number of those situations, the girl was pursuing me. And that was one thing that I never really liked. And I'm not saying that, you know, a woman shouldn't come and put herself in somebody's path. I think that's good. But you just, you got to leave it at that. And anything beyond that, it's just like, you've got to let God do it. You've got to let God work it. Or it's just, it's just not of him. And if, I was, if she was going to have a husband that was going to lead her, then it had to be a husband that was going to pursue her in the first place. Right? If you're going to lead a woman, then you have to be the one, as a guy, you have to be the one initiating. And so these were just some of the things that the Lord taught Anita. You know, while I'm going through some of this other stuff. And... So I'm 42 when we finally get married, and it's like, do I think everybody should wait till they're 42? Do you? (laughs) No. Uh, No, I don't either. Um, If I had to live my life over again, would I want to wait till 42? No. But I do know this. If I'm a slow learner, I'm just glad that I learned. Amen? I'm just glad that I learned in life. I'm just glad that God took me through those things that helped prepare my heart 
to learn those things, to learn those principles that I needed to learn to move on. And, you know, it's so true for each one of us. Like, like sure, you'd like to go back and change some of your time schedules and things. Sure, you'd like to go back and, and redo things. And we, we probably all would. Like, if I knew different stuff back here, if I was more mature in areas in my life back here, sure, I would have made different choices, but I wasn't. I am, I'm not I am who I am, <laughs> I'm not God, but, you know, I was who I was at the time, and, and God is the person who always meets you where you're at, amen, I mean, where would any of us be if God didn't meet us where we're at, and that's the beautiful thing about the Lord, he's always willing to meet us where we're at, and so forget about the past, forget about mourning the past, and thank God that he's just, he's there to meet you where you're at in, in the things that you're going on. And some of these things, I know, I know you guys know, you know, this story uh, the same as I do in these areas. Like, there's just times and areas in your life you have incredible mind battles. And I've been through some of those even recently, you know. But I wouldn't want to trade any of those things for what God teaches me in the midst of it. And so it's always about just coming back and surrendering to God and just saying, God, it's like, you've led me this far. I'm trusting you to lead me. I'm trusting you for the results of how this gets walked out, how this gets worked out. And it's from that point that I can make a commitment that I will take the next step. I will do the next thing. Surrender first. And the commitment to walk in something always becomes so much easier and so much more anointed. You know, the Spirit of God will just be on the things that you do when there's just that place of surrender in, in what you're doing. And God will bless you and honor in that. So if you're here this morning and there's just something that you need to put on the altar, you know, if you have an Isaac in your life, and God's saying, you know, just, just offer that up. Just give that up to me. Then just come forward this morning. The prayer team will be up here uh, to meet with you. Uh, maybe you're here this morning and, you know, you've been making a lot of decisions based on what you see in the natural. And God's just wanting you to trust him, you know, for what only he sees. And he's going to reveal it to you, but he's just waiting for you to come into that place where you're willing to walk it out his way. You know, there's a lot of people that want to do God's will their way. But, you know, we have to do God's will his way. And, and God's blessing, God's anointing is always on it, you know, when we come to that place. So if you want prayer this morning, uh, just come on up.